This week, we welcome Ian McShane, Vice President of Product Marketing at Endgame, to discuss security ROI. In the leadership and communication segment, even CEOs should clean their own bathrooms, sometimes, building an effective cybersecurity program, how to get booked as a podcast guest, and more. Business Security Weekly starts now. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Weekly. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Effectively securing your organization and its reputation requires a smarter approach. To maximize efficiency and minimize risk, security experts turn to Logarithm, the only leading solution built solely for security teams by a security team committed to your success. With NextGen SIM, user and entity behavior analytics, network traffic and behavior analysis, security automation and orchestration, and compliance, Logarithm provides security made smarter. How do you use the information from this show to address issues that executives actually care about? TrustedSec is a global information security consulting firm built on cutting-edge attack simulation research that extends those insights to advisory services, including governance, risk, and compliance, PCI, virtual CISO, and MITRE attack framework assessments. TrustedSec helps you translate the types of zeros and ones that you care about to the types of zeros and ones that executives care about. Go to trustedsec.com forward slash security weekly Learn how TrustedSec can become an extension of your team. Welcome to Business Security Weekly. This is episode number 122, recorded March 25th. I am your host, Matt Alderman, in G-Unit Studio, joined by my co-host, Paul Asadorian. Hey, thanks, Matt. It's good to be here. I just want to say it's timely that you're here in studio uh, because our story about why CEOs should clean the bathrooms, our bathrooms really need some cleaning. So I'm glad you're here. This is perfect. Well, <laughs> I've got a side story to that of what I did this weekend. So I had to pull the article. I was in. just telling the guys, I'm like, we, we need to do some cleaning around here. We've been like really busy, especially the last few weeks. Uh, and it's just funny you added that uh, story. And we have cigars, which I want to say uh, we're enjoying our Cuban sandwiches. Do you know Cuban sandwiches? No. So these are short filler cigars, actually Cuban cigars. Oh. Uh, but they use short filler instead of long filler. Now many people think it's like the tobacco that falls on the floor. It's really not. It's just the leftover scraps are chopped up, and that's what they use and for they filler. And they use it in here. Oh. Rather than the full, so longer pieces of the leaf. So there's more air in between the little pieces of tobacco, so they'll burn a little hotter, so smoke slower. Slower. Got I it. find, though, these are like, uh, people say Cuban cigars are really expensive and blah, blah, blah. These are like a, a buck, a buck and change a piece, and they they taste like a Cuban cigar. So they fit in the budget. They fit in the budget. At a, at a buck of sticks. So. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I tell you, and I tell you what, for a Cuban cigar, you get that experience for uh, not a high price tag, which is pretty cool. So and there's a little bit about your my cigar Your for the cigar. day. Awesome. Jose El Piedra uh, is the brand. They make mostly uh, short filler or Cuban sandwich cigars. Awesome. It's breakfast. Yes. <laughs> brunch. Have, it's brunch. It's brunch. It's brunch. Yeah. I was on the red eye, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure what yeah. meal it is <laughs> for me right now. <laughs> Register for our upcoming webcast with Recorded Future by going to securityweekly.com forward slash webcast. If you have missed any of our previously recorded webcasts, you can find them at securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. Also, join your CISO peers at the Global Cyber Innovation Summit May 1st and 2nd at the Sagamore Pendry in Baltimore, Maryland. This is an invitation only event. So please visit globalcybersummit.org forward slash request dash information to request your invitation to attend the event. All right, let's get on to our guest interview. 
Ian McShane is the Vice President of Product Marketing at Endgame. Ian has nearly two decades of experience in operational IT, security, and risk planning for enterprises, service providers, and software vendors. Previously, Ian was a Gartner analyst, lead analyst for endpoint protection and EDR, and led, uh, authored the Gartner Magic Quadrant for endpoint protection platforms. During his tenure, Ian specialized in research focused on assessing the impact of emerging technologies for security operations, breach detection, and incident response. Ian, welcome to Business Security Weekly. Gentlemen, thanks for having me. I, I just love the accent, Ian, so, you know, we can, I just want you to talk, so we're all, we're all good, because um, I, I just... Perfect. I, I can do my best Dick Van Dyke impression for you. Yeah, okay, good. Good. <laughs> so, we're going to talk security ROI, and this is a, a topic around how to align goals, resources, and budget, and I think this is a, a common theme for um, security leaders, CISOs, on how do we how do we build a program? How do we uh, staff it appropriately? How do we align budget? Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about today. So can you frame, let's frame the problem a little bit first, Ian, on, you know, what, what do you see from some of your clients on some of these challenges when it comes to justifying security spend? Yeah, the, the big issue is that every kind of budget is under stress, right? And that's not just fiscal budget. That's the human resource budget too. And, and ultimately, every organization, whether it's small or large, they have the same security aspirations. They want to continue to transact in the face of growing adversary threat, and they need to do it efficiently. But the problem is when they start to try and figure out what do we spend now? How do we improve that spending? How do we improve that spending efficiently? There's no benchmark, right? Because there's no one size fits all for any industry, for any organization. So it's a problem that spans everything. Yeah, it. In I think the part of it is figuring out, well, what am I trying to protect? What are my business goals, and then how do I build that customized program to the business? Because it is different for every business. Every every business is going to have a different set of goals and objectives they want to achieve, and then really it's aligning your program to that. And I think that's one of the first challenges that I think most senior leaders w would start to face is. I, first, I got to go talk to the business folks. W what are they trying to do and where are the potential risks that I need to mitigate and use that as kind of a starting point to say, OK, what should my program look like, which then leads to the conversation around resources and budget. So let's start with that goal alignment first. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's even more basic than that. It's really, truly, uh, truly understanding what you're doing today. And I think that's one of the hardest things any organization can try and figure out is what are we doing today? What threats are we mitigating? And is that still appropriate today? Because I, in the past you know, two or three years, I spoke to thousands of organizations and many of them were still adhering to policies that have been built piecemeal by piecemeal over a decade, maybe 15 years. And the threat landscape has, has, changed, has changed drastically. Right, so in the old policy world, I remember this in my consulting days, you'd walk into an organization and they'd hand you the policy doc and you'd look at it and it was like just, pages and pages and pages of policy. And I used to tell my consulting clients, I'd look at it and go, but can you do all this? And they're like, well, no. And I said, so, so you know what's going to happen? The auditor is going to come in. He's going to look for, you know, how do you meet all these policy requirements, which you can't do. So why don't you back up and streamline your policy down to the things that you can do? And then over time, think about enhancing it and, and, and growing it when it's appropriate. Um, so that was always yeah. the first step I did. I, I'd almost like to back up along those lines. Um, so Adrian Sanabria and I are giving a, a talk at InfoSec World sort of along these lines. And one of the things, I actually pulled up the slide deck, there's some talking points because I think it's, it, this is an important topic to talk about. And having policies and procedures is one thing. What I often find in the, when I speak with organizations is that even before that, they're unable to articulate the problem or problems that they're trying to address. Well, yeah. and, and, and you know, like often they'll be like, well, I need to endpoint security. And it's like, well, hold on, back up. Even before your policies and procedures, can we talk about like what exact problem you're trying to solve in your environment? And oftentimes that becomes the topic of the call because they're like, I can't articulate the problem I'm trying to solve. I just think I need endpoint security. I'm like, well, let's back up and then we'll make that decision. You know, <laughs> once we define the problem, right? 
Yeah, the, and I mean, the big thing as well is, is understanding what, as an organization, what you absolutely have to do, right? Yep. What are the compliance regulations that you mm -hmm. literally have to do to be able to continue doing your business? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And it's that alignment, that first set of alignment to say, mm -hmm. all right, I'm, I'm bound by these regulations. Therefore, I have kind of a framework of what I need to do. But even in that particular case, there are certain things you may decide that aren't that important um, mm -hmm. right away either. And it's, and it's understanding what are those big problems, maybe not every problem, but the big problems I need to try to address first. Right. And then use that as a guideline to start to figure out, okay, then what types of solutions would I eventually need as I put certain policies and procedures? Well, in and it's interesting, and I, and I like how Ian brought up compliance, because oftentimes folks will be like, well, my problem is I have to be compliant with XYZ standard. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, no, <laughs> now there's a whole different set of questions, right? Like in that compliance framework, what do you have to do? Does it mandate that you have to do certain things? And then your other problem could be, well, how do you know if you're compliant or not? And then your other problem is how do I uh, adapt when I'm not compliant and keep tabs on that over time as my architecture changes, right? And, and so those yeah. are almost like three separate yeah. problems just under the umbrella of compliance, which I don't get me wrong, it's a great place to start. It is, but it, it also potentially puts us in a really weird position to say, all right, here's, here's my checklist of all the things I have to do. I need a log management, mm -hmm. I need an endpoint, I need a this, I need a that. And you haven't actually gone through to say, well, what things do I have in place? Mm -hmm. What things do I really need to, to focus on? Because if you just take that compliance activity as, as kind of a checklist, you'll buy a bunch, potentially buy a bunch of solutions, but you may not be any better off at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and listen to the way we're talking about this, right? We're talking about this like product people. We're talking about requirements in terms of must have, should have, and kind of nice to have, which is a really good kind of way to bucket up what your security strategy is. What do I absolutely have to do? And then what should I do that goes beyond that? Because we all know compliance isn't there for the, the safety of humanity, right? It's mm -hmm. there to cover everyone's backside. So what do you have to do? What should you do? And then as a, as a person, as a professional, what do you actually want to do? What do you want to achieve? Yeah. And so do you build an MVP then for your security program? <laughs> hey, maybe you know, that's you a do. great idea, I think, actually. Right? If you think about it, that's what, th that's what product guys would do. We'd build a, minimi a minimal viable product, mm -hmm. which would be kind of the base of the things we have to do before we could go to market and on product. You could almost think about your security program in a similar light. I have limited resources, which I do. I have limited budget, which I probably do. Therefore, I have to come up with that MVP of my initial security program based on priorities to say, this is what it looks like. And then over time, as you get more budget, more resources, you can do more things and continue to expand it just like we would when we built a product. Yeah, you're building a security roadmap, right? You're saying, here's, here's what I absolutely have to deliver in my MVP, and here's going to be the incremental updates, the incremental improvements I make as I go along. And then you take in additional data to understand what changes do I need to, to steer in the right direction, given that the, the threat landscape that's unique to my organization is changing. Right. And it would also help you start to identify that resource kind of gap, the, the budget gap, and, and start to help put a plan together that you can share with the executives and the board on these are the, okay, here's where we are. These are the risks we also have to address and mitigate, but here's the resources I'm gonna need to continue to do that. That would be a really good way to have that initial conversation, I think, with the business and the executive side to really start to figure out what that future funding of both resources and dollars then eventually look like. Yeah, you can, you can start to think about the metrics that are important to, to you as a uh, information security leader, and then your board or the budget approver, CEO, whoever can start to make decisions based on the metrics that are important to them, right? And in most of the conversations I have, that tends to boil down into four things. So the time to detect something bad happened, the time to contain that bad thing from happening, um, anywhere else, the time to respond to it. So not necessarily fix it, but respond and do something. And then the time to remediate. So actually fixing the root cause of the problem. And obviously there are different things you can do at different phases of that to mitigate the impacts further down the chain and making, I think, solid decisions on, on every investment or policy change reflecting one of those metrics is a way to, again, have the ability to be flexible and steer that strategy in the right direction. 
Yeah, so does that mean you really kind of start, back to our MVP discussion, is it then really a detection initial capability that, that you kind of focus on first? Because without detection, containment and response and, and eventual mitigation recovery just can't happen. Yeah, I think I think so. Right? Let's, let's assume for a second that everyone has some kind of prevention capability, right? I think I don't think there's any great, well, there's very much greenfield, especially in endpoint security now that, you know, the OS vendors are starting to bundle some uh, prevention in there. It's figuring out how you get to that next phase is the detection piece. You're quite right. Yeah, I think that's a that's an area a I mean, lot of people certain focus. Sorry, the other things to think of is that. I find it funny that every organization has a detection capability already. It just tends to be humans as opposed to something mm. software based. But I like that as an overarching policy, Ian, you know, setting up uh, our minimum detection time for an event. And you may even classify it as an event of this type in this area or involves this data, right? Provided the organization has that, so some of those mappings anyway. Um, and, and putting forth that as a requirement so that when you go look to implement a solution, whether it's something you already have, whether it's people in the operating system logs that you're working with, because if you have people and you have operating systems, you have logs <laughs> that you can go look at, right? right? Without any other tools, you have logs. Um, how do you get those detection times to your acceptable amount within the first day? And then as you develop your further processes, procedures, and implement products, that's one thing they have to adhere to. You have to be able to help us detect threats within the first, you know, 24 hours. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, I like the way that it removes the emotion from it, right? If, you, yeah. if you're talking about four areas and you say, right, if we want to, there's, there's more than one way to skin a cat. So there is, you know, we could invest money in additional software to improve how fast we can contain something, or we can hire, you know, four or five guys and girls to go through those logs and improve our detection of, of advanced threats. But it removes the, the emotion of, hey, we've definitely got this renewal coming up. So we need to renew that. And that's going to come out of budget X, Y, and Z. And you start to really look at it from an inside out perspective, right? What does our organization need from the tools and the services and the people that we have versus what can our organization get from the tools and the people and the processes that we have? Right. I think another great measurement along these lines, and I, I love this discussion, Ian and Matt, is that um, also the growth and scalability of both your organization and your network, right? I was actually just doing a briefing with a packet capture. They make hardware and software packet captures, right? We're talking about 10, 40, 100 gig. And uh, you need to be able to measure that first of all, right? And sometimes you may not even have the gear to be able to measure just how much traffic you have, uh, you know, going and where it's going. But you have to understand that and then understand the business growth. How fast are we going to grow as a company in terms of employees, in terms of customers, in terms of our network, and at least be able to project that out a little bit so that when you do go find a solution, you have to say, look, it's got to support you know, 10 gig across these number of sites mm -hmm. and build in a lot of extra uh, you know, growth in there too. Say it's 15 sites and you know, I know we're going from 10 gig to, I think we're going to skip 40 gig and go right to 100, but maybe your requirement is, is, is 100 gig. Yeah, and that's a, you know that's aligning. Well, that's all about aligning the security program with the business goals, right? Mm -hmm. If your business goal is to scale, you know, two x or three x, realistically, is is your security budget going to track that linearly and get you know double or treble over time? Of course, it's not. But you need to be able to explain here's the here's the downfall of not investing alongside the the company growth or the projection growth. Yeah, yeah. It, That's it, important with IT as well, right? Yeah. Are we going to go in the cloud? Are we going to have serverless? How much of it? At what rate are we going to grow in those areas so that you can adopt solutions that you don't have to throw out in six months? Because or a year? those are new risk areas that right. now need to be addressed that maybe you didn't account for in the original program mm -hmm. that you walked mm -hmm. into. It was, it, uh, the assumption maybe back when you built your program in the first place was I'm all on prem and now I'm going cloud, multi cloud whatever, mm -hmm. and, and now there's a whole new set of risks that now need to be mitigated and potentially a whole new set of tools yep. and processes and, and resources to actually it doesn't mitigate have to be that. if you get ahead of it. True. Yeah. But that means you're aligning mm -hmm. where the business is going and having your program be in lockstep with that. Um, both yeah. Ideally, you can look at every spend in your security program and say, this is the metric it impacts. And that could be a positive impact 
and it may be a detrimental impact somewhere else, but understanding that every investment you make, whether it's people, software, subscription, whatever, every investment you make has an impact somewhere and that your impact is by design and not <laughs> accidental. <laughs> Right. Because there's probably stuff sitting in people's security programs today that are just maybe not relevant anymore. But yeah. they but mm -hmm. they've been you've been spending money on it for so long, mm -hmm. you're you're literally just renewing, renewing, renewing and not really reevaluating. Do I even need that even, capability? Even right. You know, one of the great ones I hear is being able to scan an endpoint for for um file-based malware every day or every week right and you ask why do you need to scan every disk for that you're you know what's what's behind it oh it's a policy it's a policy that's been in place for 15 years sometimes it can be pci sometimes it can be you know regulatory but more often than not it's a case of we've always done it like this why why wouldn't we yeah right like scanning my network quarterly or yeah monthly in the VM or world, right. right in the vm world yeah. right i mean people had programs that but in you know threats are coming on and off the network all the time mm -hmm. if you're only scanning quarterly you're not going to pick up half of that stuff right mm -hmm. and, and that's exactly. a decision you have to adjust to the resources and the budget that you have if you're going to increase that frequency for example yeah yeah very true um so we talked a little bit about metrics you know obviously you've got metrics around detection then containment, response, some mitigation. And as you start to build those metrics, how often should these types of metrics be reported? Is it something that's more real time? Is it something that's more quarterly? I mean, what, what are you seeing from the kind of the reporting side as you're building your program, you're building these metrics, hopefully aligned to the business goals. But then what's that reporting structure back out on the other side? How often is it? And, and again, there's no one size fits all. So I, I see things, um, see organizations that report weekly. Some of them do it quarterly because it aligns with, you know, QBR meetings that they have to, you know, report their spend or their improvement versus spend. I think the important thing is that it's regular and that it's comparable to a previous point in time. Right. When I, when I talk to some organizations and say, we don't measure anything today, you know, what's the, you know, when, what's the best frequency to do it? Well, the best time to start doing it was yesterday. The best time to do it is now, you know, blah, blah, blah. But making sure you have that baseline that you can compare something to. Because again, what this comes back, back to is being able to reflect on the success of your investment. You know, we planned to do X with our uh, time to response and we invested Y dollars in it. How much of a tangible impact has that had? So I don't know personally that I can think of a good schedule to, to do that reporting on other than it should be regular and it should be uh, repetitive right right yeah and I, I would imagine that with uh, you know more and more of, of security being a board level issue that's probably more on a at least a quarterly basis but maybe those metrics on a more frequent basis actually help you improve your program in between the quarterly reports but i i, I would guess that anything longer than quarterly is probably not often enough yeah, I mean, and the other thing, I mean, we talk about reporting metrics as a way to um, substantiate budget, whatever. But I think also it's important to report these internally to employees, people that are not necessarily in InfoSec and, and don't really understand the maybe the reason behind some uh, control enforcement points or some some policies and procedures that we as, uh, as security professionals make them do. So doing more regular, maybe briefer or more high level updates internally about, you know, the way that we're improving us, the security of our systems can make sense. But I think you're right, you know, aligning it to that, that quarterly cadence from a reporting up perspective is probably right. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'd argue even more often to internal IT folks. I mean, yeah, I like your idea of presenting it to the whole company. Certainly I've, you know, been in those situations and it does have a positive impact in my opinion. But I like reporting metrics to people who can do the thing you learn, you know, my kids are, in elementary school, right? And they, they're asked early on, does my answer make sense, right? When you do math. Mm -hmm. I like reporting my metrics to the people that can do that based on the metrics. So I'll go to my Windows team and I'll say, you know, we did analysis, we worked together, you know, I got permission and I evaluated some aspect of security on your systems. And I found that there were 8 million, you know, 400,000 patches missing on, you know, in this department. And they're like, 
well, that number just doesn't make sense, right? It's the same thing you did in elementary school. They can tell you, like, that number doesn't make sense. And right. now you have to be able to validate your metrics. I think that's an important part of validating your metrics. I mean, I do it all the time with the podcast uh, metrics too, right? Like, I'll go to Mark and say, you know, Mark, you publish all the episodes. Like, does this number make sense? And we both have to kind of like look at each other and like, just make sure that that number makes sense and then adjust kind of moving from there. So. Well, we, we do yeah. the same thing internally too at Security Weekly. Yeah. Every month when I come in Sales, studio, whatever it is, we yeah. go through mm -hmm. all of our budget tracking metrics, where we are from a sales perspective, where we are against our plan, so you know how many toys you can go buy in, in the sure. budget, right? It, we do it on a monthly basis because I think that transparency is good for us internally as mm -hmm. we run our business here. Um, and, and so the same thing I think would apply internally to a security or an IT team is more often helps you at least kind of before that stuff goes to the board on a quarterly basis, at least you know where you are and it's not a surprise three months later when you finally pull all the metrics together. Yep. Exactly. And, and the, I love the way you're framing it because you're talking about things that are actionable, right? So you're getting these metrics and you're asking yourself, does this make sense? Is it something that we can improve on or change? Is there, yep. is there some kind of outcome associated with this? And it, it kind of reminds me of when an, you know, a vendor or an organization pins the success or the failure of their their budget spend on whether or not they blocked a certain amount of threats like it used to be you know five or ten years ago when i worked in email security you'd see all of the email security vendors talking about how many um pieces of spam they blocked um or a company that maybe blocked <laughs> hundreds of thousands of malicious attachments and that's great but as an organization you can't use that kind of figure that kind of arbitrary someone sending us bad stuff to make decisions because there's not much you can take this actionable out of that just because someone is potentially trying to attack you that could stop tomorrow or that could increase tomorrow right it's not actionable right yeah and it, it's really boiling down those metrics that you can take action off of to adjust throughout mm -hmm. the course of, of running that program yeah I, it, it may not be actionable but i think it also speaks to provide and prove the value of the solution right which is oftentimes where we might start with that type of metric because one it's easy to understand i think sometimes we get way too complicated with our metrics <laughs> but saying you know our firewall or our spam gateway blocked you know on average blocks this many amount of packets or um uh, emails per month is a good metric for management to hear to say you know you don't hear about the security incidents unless it gets past some of these defenses that we are like eliminating a lot of that noise so that we can focus on stuff that that, that does you know get inside on our systems right and but it brings but, us back to have that baseline right being yes. able to understand what does this number mean in context with normality is this abnormal is this usual correct right correct. like a ddos attack right i mean you would see yeah, yeah. activity that that wouldn't be normal in the baseline then you know that those number something's going on and you mm -hmm. can respond to it that's the actionability piece of that Right. is that you see those, but without that baseline, you wouldn't know whether it's normal or abnormal. Correct. Yeah. So Ian, if you think about kind of a, an approach, we, we talked a little bit about the buckets. What are some recommendations for people who, maybe it's a, a new CISO just stepped into the role. Where do they start? Um, and then how would they kind of start that plan going forward it, you know just what what are what are you seeing with some of your clients yeah i, I think that the day one thing is understanding what you're doing today um and that can be you, you can look at what we're we spending over a year and uh, what are the big the big spends rank it in terms of size of investment and figure out if you can how effective that is or at a minimum figure out what the goal of that investment is and you know to, to kind of paraphrase and go back to those four buckets you could try and go through your annual spend and say right which of these goes into prevention which of these goes into detection containment response remediate and just understand where you are because again if, you, if you're day one as a CISO and you start thinking about what do I need to change or you start taking direction from the board or the, the CEO who's asking you to make decisions fast right that's what they hired you for make make intelligent decisions you need to understand where you are today because again you want to be able to reflect in a month on or in, on, in a quarter on the changes that you, you've made and whether they've had a positive and the expected impact. Yeah, so kind of break down your budget in those different buckets, figure out mm -hmm. how they align to goals, which makes sense. But, but I think the hardest one is still trying to figure out some of those appropriate metrics in each of those um, to really see if 
they're effective and then being able to measure when you make changes am i improving my overall effectiveness or not i think that's a challenge for for a lot of people yeah and the reason it's a challenge again is because there's no one size fits all what's what's effective for me might not be effective for, for paul in his role right it's if we even deployed exactly the same tools with the same number of staff there's going to be variances that mean it's it's, it's different our, our outcomes are going to be different so really understanding where you are and again kind of measuring where you are in, in, in a period of time whether it's a week or a quarter now it's to your point, it's going to be difficult to know up front whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but you've got that record and you can start to see the impact of changes. Yeah. What does, when when we think about the, the buckets, are they all equal or is there going to be variation across those buckets? Is there an expectation of how much I should be spending in prevention versus detection versus response, et cetera? Or is it just going to be based on uh, your situation, your goals, objectives, et cetera, you, you might be heavier in certain areas than others, and that's just the way it is. Yeah, I, I mean, I would expect to pay more in kind of the, the post-breach side of things. I think prevention has been around, especially in the endpoint space, right? Prevention has been around for a long time, and it's um, there's relatively little greenfield. Everyone is doing something with with AV or file-based malware detection, and usually even more, you know, some of the adversary-based stuff too. So I would, I would expect the investment to start to become in the more advanced side of things, the detection and response that's only been around for you know, four or five years and is only just coming into the mainstream. That's where I would expect the majority of new spend to be. Yeah, so you see that shifting away from heavy in prevention, start to move more into detection, but then it's all on the back end, right? I mean, the resources needed to respond and, and remediate is where the majority of your costs eventually will, will come. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of vendors and, you know, uh, audacious plug here, you know, vendors like Endgame are really focusing on how you get those advanced capabilities into the mainstream. So you don't have to have such a heavy spend on, on people or experience to get those more advanced capabilities. Right. Yeah. And I think that's where the tooling helps and automation of certain processes and other things. And that's where you're going to understanding what you have and, you know, not just products that you have, but the, the skill set of your team. I think that's, that's just as important. Yeah. yeah, that really drives your, your program. I'm glad you know, we mentioned that, I think, a, a couple of times in this discussion, is that you may be heavier in one area or have a different strategy based on your business goals and based on the resources, people, and technology that you have on hand, right? If uh, your user population is more Mac or Linux rather than Windows, you're going to have a different strategy, right? Same thing on your, your server side. And... You know, if you've got a great network security team, right, you might be a little more heavy on the, the packet capture network uh, end of things than, than if not. So, I mean, it depends on your architecture and your people. And also with your people, I think like what they're good at and what they're passionate about also, you know, drives a mm -hmm. lot of your program too. Yeah, I mean, what the skills are they going to be comfortable with, right? right? The skill set you have or the skill set you don't have yet, right, as you right. make those shifts, because that's where, you know, there's certain tasks you might be able to automate. Now, you, you want those skill that skill set to to kind of ramp up and do the yeah. more advanced stuff. I think that's the you hardest. You may have it, or you may have to go hire it. It's the hardest thing I I think. You know, as you talk to different enterprises, right, and you make a recommendation, you're like, well, a lot of people are having great success with X Y Z product or strategy, and a lot of people say, yeah, yeah, I can see that. And then there's always like that the edge case where they're like, yeah, we tried that, it was terrible. Like it just <laughs> didn't work for them, right? And it truly <laughs> is, you know, people, you know, talk about RSA, how these, all these vendors, uh, we've been, you know, recommending vendors for, for 14 years. And there's no like one solution that works for 100% of the people out there. Like right. there, there just isn't. There are always going to be varying degrees of, of success. And a lot of that, I think, depends on your business, your goals, uh, your architecture and infrastructure and the people. And yeah. your culture too. Yeah, definitely. So Ian, my last question, unless Paul has, is security ROI possible? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the magic question. And I think <laughs> if I had the answer to that, I would probably be spinning up my own business to calculate that algorithm. So it would be easy to figure it out. Uh, again, just like Paul said, right? It, it, the ROI isn't just a return on investment for your spend. It's the return on the investment for your people, return on investment to the amount of time you spend formulating a strategy. So 
if I had to be binary, I would say no. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, I think that's what most people would expect. Mm. You know, is that ROI for security is really difficult, <laughs> um, especially you know as as the the landscape shifts and and figuring out what the new uh, threat vectors are and what new products and people I need and figuring the right metrics and being able to measure it and baseline it, it's hard. And so yeah. I think it's really hard to justify that kind of return on investment. I actually think it's easier in the application sense, application security, because so many of the security processes and tools that we're talking about are largely are aimed at making a developer's life easier and more efficient, right? So they're catching bugs earlier, in the process, which is much easier to fix and later in the process is a very basic example. But a lot of the technology and processes like DevOps and Agile, like that's a win for security. But also if you're going down this path, you're producing, I believe, much better quality code at a much faster rate. Now yeah. you can also introduce security vulnerabilities more quickly, but Correct. it's a balance, yeah. act, right? You're struggling yeah. to to fix those as equally as, as fast. And I think at the end, your return on investment is we're producing better code more quickly. I would I would like to see that return on investment discussion being more about people, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than talking about from a business sense, if I spend X on vendor Y, what's my total cost of ownership or return on investment? But how, how often would it be more beneficial for you to spend money on your team's knowledge and experience? Mm -hmm. Whether it's you know sans courses, whether it's you know whatever, uh, whatever kind of investment or education you want to invest, and that could even be hiring people with more experience so that they impart their knowledge on the, the rest of your team as well. Yep. Yeah. Agree. True. That's all I had. That's all I had. Okay. Perfect. Ian, thank you for joining us on Business Security Weekly. If anybody wants to learn more about Endgame, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash Endgame. We'll take a quick break and then cover the leadership and communications articles for this week.